Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm here until eleven. Welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. Welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. Today, uh, we are we will be calling on uh, these sites that you already know. The schedule is as follows: We start with a short introduction, and then uh, we talk about artificial evolution morphogenesis. We have. Two highlights, two guest presentations, one by Francesco Mondado from EPFL and one by Robert Rehner from ETH Zurich, which will be broadcast from California. And the lecture today, as you can see here, will be broadcast from the University of Madrid, Carlos III. And the host today is Professor Fabio Bonsignorio. Now, just uh, for uh, geography, the, uh, if you look at this, these are the participating sites, and the Madrid would be somewhere there uh, in the center. Now, what I will do is, so that you have an idea what people do here in uh, Madrid, in the field of artificial intelligence and robotics, I will pass the floor for a second to uh, Professor uh, Bonsignorio. And uh, let me see. Yes. So he will shortly uh, introduce the laboratory here. Why don't you sit here? Go ahead. Hi, everybody. So uh, let me say first that we are very happy to have the here on. Uh, Fabio, your microphone is not on. Maybe you could use Rolf's microphone. Okay, let me say first, sorry. Can you hear me, Nathan? Nathan? It's okay now. It's okay, now. Oh. okay, let me say first of all, thanks to Rolf for, for being here. We are very glad and I would say honored to have uh, such an important researcher here. And uh, I, I, I will now do a very short introduction about the robotics lab, which is actually hosting the Shanghai lectures here in, in Carlos III in, in Madrid. So the robotics lab uh, is, um, I would say, a middle-sized uh, robotics uh, research center. We have about uh, 40 researchers. Uh, about, of this, about 15 are PhD and 30 are, are students. Uh, we have a, a long history. Actually, the history of robotics lab uh, uh, started in '92 when this university, which is uh, one uh, very young university, started. And uh, we are, like many others, active in many <laughs> in many fields, uh, like from uh, mobile robotics to uh, to uh, assistive robotics or so and social robotics, uh, and even, even humanoids. So we are. Uh, um, we are working on many things. We are also involved in, in the Fed flagship uh, proposal, which is a famous initiative uh, ongoing in Europe now. And that's all for now, because I think we, we, we should try to save time, and I will give back the floor to Rolf. Thank you, Rolf, again. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so back, maybe we can switch off the other microphone. Uh, so uh, back again, uh, let's now do the following. So as you know, we still have this ongoing frame of reference uh, issue competition, and this issue is so fundamental, as I mentioned many times, that I should mention it every week. So if you don't remember anything about the lecture series, you should remember the frame of reference problem. And should I forget, the first one to notice is entitled to either a bottle of champagne or a box of Swiss chocolate. Now, perhaps we can, uh, Nathan, we can briefly switch to Berlin 
where we have a lucky winner of the FOR competition because I think about three weeks, two or three weeks ago, I forgot to mention the problem in Markus Scheunemann from the Humboldt University in Berlin from Professor Hafner's laboratory noticed that. So maybe, and I think uh, uh, Verena will now hand over the, the, the chocolate to uh, Marcus. Okay, Verena? Hello, Rolf. Hello from Hi. Berlin. So we have the lucky winner here, and we also have the chocolate here. So it's a huge uh, box of Swiss Lind uh, chocolate. Actually, it's with 24 pieces, and you're supposed to eat one each day, but I'm not sure whether Marcus can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. can do that. So, um, yeah. Right, so congratulations. 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 And as you can see by the size you, of the box, it's really worth paying attention. <laughs> okay, so the, the competition will continue un until the end of the lecture series. So it's really worth paying attention. And thanks a lot, Verena, for uh, you know, managing the, uh, the chocolate. So Verena also got, hit, got her PhD in our laboratory in Zurich, so she's very familiar with uh, Switzerland and Swiss chocolate. Okay, thanks again, Verena. Okay, now we're back in uh, Madrid, and so today it's gonna be uh, evolution, evolution cognition from scratch. Uh, last week, uh, we didn't have a class, and uh, you were asked to view the recorded video on uh, building brains for bodies, and one of the issues that were discussed there is what's called the brain in a vat. So imagining that you have an isolated brain in a nutritious liquid, but it's not connected to a body. And I think it's a very philosophically a very interesting problem and issue, namely because our main topic in this lecture series is actually embodiment. And I'm looking for a volunteer for a short presentation of Brain in a Vat. Maybe uh, we can ask our new friends from Łódź who joined the, uh, from Łódź in Poland, who joined the uh, Shanghai lectures just today, whether they would like to uh, make a short presentation next week. Okay. We can do that after the class. Chiba, Chiba, maybe. Can you switch off the microphone? Or who is? Uh, I think there is a lot of noise in the in the. Uh, Lecturer. Okay, so last week we had the uh, lecture on artificial neural networks. There are many excellent books. There is also some text in, uh, in the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, and those who are really interested, they can join the lecture in the spring term where we go in depth into neural networks. But for now, let's continue. And one of the I guess fundamental principles or fundamental issues are the time perspectives. Whenever we are interested in understanding or designing intelligent systems, we always have to focus on three time perspectives. So there is one which is called, which is called the, uh, the here and now, uh, which is the actual mechanism. So basically, you know, the way it works, we look at an insect, we look at the neural system, and we look at the wiring, and you know, if there is some kind of stimulation, the insect will react in a particular way. That's the here and now perspective. Then we have the second one, which is the ontogenetic perspective, which means the, uh, the time scale of um, the lifetime of an individual. And then we have the phylogenetic time scale, which is over generations. Now, if we look at this in some detail, we find that uh, we have here what's the here and now uh, perspective. That's the state-oriented perspective. The next one is called the ontogenetic one, ontogenetic and learning. So basically what we design here is we design the learning and developmental mechanisms and the initial conditions. And then we let the system 
interact with the environment and develop on its own. And the third one is then the evolutionary or the phylogenetic perspective over many generations. Here we would design the evolutionary algorithms and then have a population of individuals and let them evolve uh, what we want. And I'm going to give you examples on how that works. Right, now just to get into the spirit of artificial evolution, let's look at the Reckenberg's fuel pipe problem. So it was basically in the 1960s, Reckenberg was at the, uh, an engineer at the uh, Technical University of uh, Berlin, and he asked the following question. He said, okay, let's assume we have a fuel pipe here, and the fuel is coming in this way, and for some reason it has to sort of be directed uh, over here. Now, the question was, what is the optimal shape connecting this pipe? And so the fuel pipe from the fuel comes in here, should go this way. Question, what is the optimal shape of the connecting piece here? Now, normally people would think this is a quarter circle, but it turns out uh, Reckenberg did an evolutionary algorithm, you know, where he could vary the shape that the optimal shape actually has, you know, a, a particular hunch here. And human designers did not come up with that solution. So now, of course, and, but, but the, the, uh, the evolutionary system did. Now the question, and indeed, if you do the physics on this problem, you see that this is indeed the one with the hunch here is indeed the better solution than the quarter circle. Now, the question that comes up is, well, is this a creative, is this a solution creative? I mean, can computers in that sense, or robots, can they be creative? Maybe we can briefly switch to, uh, if Moscow is connected, maybe we can briefly switch to Moscow for a short statement about whether you think computers or robots can be creative. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the problem in uh, the level of abstraction. Uh, what is the body, uh, really? Uh, is the software in the computer or computer itself? Uh, if we talk about uh, creativity as a problem kind of new solutions, then yes, computers are creative. Uh, but uh, if we talk about uh, creativity as an ability to self-restructuring uh, or self-reorganizing, uh, uh, then computers are not creative. Okay. That's my point okay. of view. Okay, very okay. good. So, so thank you very much uh, uh, for your statement. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, there is, uh, an, in the movie I, Robot, there is an interesting scene where a human talks to the robot, and the human says to the robot, well, a robot could never write a symphony like Beethoven, and then the robot says to the human, could you? And so it's, you know, most of the time, I mean, it's a very difficult, I think it's a very difficult issue, and I think you make an interesting point in Moscow about the different levels of abstraction. In any case, I think what's really interesting is that these kinds of computer programs, they come up with very interesting solutions. For example, uh, this one, uh, this antenna for satellites for NASA, where NASA actually decided to use the designs that were done by computer programs, by evolutionary algorithms, rather than by human beings. Okay, now there is a famous problem, uh, which is, uh, you know, this, this one now, you have four corners of a square, and you have to connect the four uh, corners of the square with three straight lines ending up in the starting corner. Maybe we can briefly switch to Zurich for a suggestion on a solution. Okay. 
What will be the uh, solution? One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. Um, actually, you have to think outside of the box. So you. Ah. you could, <laughs> okay. I, I knew good. I knew the task to be um, ah, to be honest. that's cheating. That's cheating. Yeah, I know. You <laughs> Do you want me to okay. to answer the question uh, nevertheless? Okay. Do you want me to answer the question, even if I know? Yes, please do. Okay. Yes, please do. So you could start um, uh, at the top left uh, dot. Top left, okay. Uh, then go down, straight, and go a little further down, and then diagonally to the right, uh, yeah. and top again. I have a bit a problem with the cursor. Yeah. Oh like yeah. This. Okay. And then to the left again, and then you have. And then All of them. Again. Okay. Yeah, I have. I can't write that's it. now. I, I, the, the writing system doesn't work. But yes, that's exactly so. You have to go beyond the square. Even if we talk about the square, normally people think inside the square. And so this is to demonstrate yes, that we always have our biases, and we're not aware that we actually have these biases. You must pass through all four. Art, 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 like this. Yeah. yeah. Can you, can the other side, switch off the microphones? Please, everybody, switch off the microphones. Okay, thank you. So, we, have, we always have our biases. However, if we have computer programs, computer programs only have in there what we program into them, and so they don't have the biases. And with artificial evolution, it's similar to that. So, that artificial evolution has actually a long history. Uh, in the 1960s, John Holland, Ingo Reckenberg, John Cosa, and normally we talk about GAs, genetic algorithms. Uh, Reckenberg was more interested in using evolution for uh, engineering problems, and Cosa developed this notion of genetic programming. Now, what's interesting about, and I will not go into too much detail, I think what's interesting about uh, evolution is this concept of cumulative selection, which was championed also by uh, Richard Dawkins, author of The Selfish Gene. Now, he is also very outspoken about the creationists. So watch out for the creationists. <clears throat> there is now in the United States a renaissance, you know, that people really believe in creation. And they talk about intelligent design. And we are also talking about design of intelligent systems. And sometimes people call this intelligent design. But it's fundamentally different from what the creationists uh, in the United States mean. So careful, you know, whenever you hear the creationists. Now, um, Dawkins gives a very interesting example of to introduce uh, genetic algorithms or evolutionary algorithms, namely the... Uh, what he calls the biomorphs. And so he has these beautiful uh, creatures here and then a concept which is called aesthetic selection. And the, the term biomorph comes from a, an artist, a painter, Desmond uh, Morris. Now there is there's a particular encoding, and I was wondering whether I didn't have... Is someone going to... Uh, did I have someone who would explain the... Uh, Could some, oh, I can't do this. Oops, I think I, I have a, a problem there. Okay, uh, let me see. Is someone got, yeah, Osaka? Is Osaka University connected? Is Osaka University connected? Uh, maybe not, huh? Ah, yes. Yeah. Hi. Can you, could you give a short introduction? Could you give a short introduction to the biomorphs? Or did you not uh, get, the, uh, get the message? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do it myself, but. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, very well. 
Yes. Well, Richard Dawkins, he talked about biomorphs uh, as, a, an, as a visual representation of complex forms, in this case, like uh, genes, that exactly. the, these designs are product of random mutations that are also right. followed by, by non-random selection. Right. And how is the selection performed? Well, that's uh, what he called aesthetic selection, which is basically there's some criteria that uh, he used to select some specific design. Let's say it's if at first it begins like a random evolutionary, but then it starts by uh, uh, using some criteria to select what he wants to shape as the as the gene of the product. Exactly, and so the criteria are typically aesthetic criteria, you know, right? Yes. So what he likes, bigger ones or colors or, you know, whatever. So I think it's it really defining different. the yeah. shape. Yeah, and, and the, the particular shapes. Okay, I think, and here uh, you want to say something about the encoding. So what we always need is some encoding in the genome, right? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? Okay, no, no, that, that's fine, yeah. So I think, I think we, can, we can see it, we can see it on the slide here. So this is the genome and here it shows how the properties of the creatures that we see displayed on the screen are actually encoded. I mean, this is just to, to get started on this. Now, there's, thank you very much to Osakam. So there is actually uh, a scheme, you know, there's a big literature about evolutionary computation, about evolutionary ap approaches, and there is an overall scheme and all the approaches, or let's say 95% of the approaches, they fit into this general scheme. So we start with a genotype, this is the encoding of the problem. This is developed into a phenotype, process of development. Then they have to do something in the real world. They have to interact with each other. They have to move in particular ways. Then there is a process of selection. So we have a fitness function. There is a process of selection that selects the best individuals and then there is a new population, and then there is a process of reproduction, which is mutation or selection, and I think this is just a cartoon version. Okay, now we are going to evolve, as an example, the controller for this robot here, which is a very simple robot. It only has two motors here, and it has three sensors here, and then the motors need to be, uh, the sensors need to be connected to the motors. Now, what do we need to specify here if uh, we want to evolve a controller for this, uh, for this robot? Maybe we can switch to uh, Berlin for a second. Okay. Okay, so what do we need to specify here if we want to get a controller? Um, I think uh, we need uh, some way to specify how the sensors are connected to the motors and maybe okay. also yes. how different sensors are integrated um, in a larger neural network maybe to get some kind of control signal. Okay, so let's assume these are simple infrared sensors, distance, rough distance sensors. So you would connect them to the motors, right? This one to here, this one to here. If you don't know the connectivity, you just connect everything to everything. So you connect this sensor to this motor also, this sensor to this motor, and this sensor to this motor. Okay, and then, what do you do then? What's the next step? Yeah, the next step um, would be to uh, test several uh, robots with slightly different uh, connection strengths from the That's sensors right. to the motors and select the best one and uh, modify the connections randomly and test them again and so on. Right. So, right. So implicitly you already sort of assumed that there is some kind of an encoding of these connection strengths in the genome, right? 
uh, as you can you can see here, this would be kind of an initial genome. So we have six connections, three from the sensors to the left motor, three from the sensors to the right motors. We got this encoding. And then we do the mutation on that, and this will give, this is a binary representation. This is for the first connection weight with four bits, the second connection weight with four bits, and this gives the uh, connection weights. And this, again, fits into this scheme. Now, we need a fitness function for this robot. Can we briefly switch to Chiba, maybe? And you can give us an idea on the fitness function that you would, you might want to use. I mean, so what does what does it depend on the fitness function? Uh, fitness function exactly dependent on the task. So first we need to define a task for the robot. Uh, right. For example, uh, uh, finding the exit. So during that case, we can define the fitness function. Uh, the distance traveled and without uh, obstacle collision. So taking into consideration these two concepts. Exactly. And the, the distance traveled would be positive, whereas... Yes. Uh, the collision uh, will be the negative effect on the fitness function. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's exactly right. If we want the robot to travel as far as possible without collisions, that's what we need to do. And designing a fitness function is really an art, and there are no really systematic ways in which we can do this. And then we select the best ones, and you know there are various selection schemes that I won't go into here. And then we have two uh, reproduction functions. One is crossover. So we choose randomly a crossover point here. We take two. We take two. Uh, genes, uh, genomes, choose a crossover point, and then we take this, put it here, we take this, put it here, and this one comes here, and then this one we take from here. And so we get two new individuals, and the hope is that by recombining these uh, genomes, that we keep the good combinations and make a new one that might even have better combinations. Normally, this will not be the case, but it might actually happen. And then the second process that we use is mutation. So we randomly choose a particular bit or a particular location in the genome, and with a certain probability, we flip it. Now, the question is, big question is, how do we choose the mutation rate? So maybe we can briefly have a statement from Xi'an on the mutation rate. So what would be the considerations in choosing the mutation rate? OK. Hello. Can you make it a louder? Hmm? We can't hear you. It's not loud enough. Hello. Yeah, can you? Hello. Yeah, can you? Can you keep, can you the, keep go the, closer to the microphone and speak a little louder? Closer to the you microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, if you, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think we should choose a probable mutation rate because the genetic algorithm is a simulation of the real world. It takes a very long period for creatures to evolve, and everything has to protect the excellent genes and keep its main features, so the mutation rate should be small. And I think once mutation rate is very large, for example, the people, uh, the child's DNA will be very different from his parents, so it will be hard for us to identify Whose child it is? Uh, whose child he is? Um, and uh, I think it also should not be too small because everything is ch changing. Uh, we must change to we must change to adapt to the changing world. Okay. 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 Yes. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, considerations on choosing the mutation rate. It's always an issue how you should choose it. There are actually some genetic algorithms, namely uh, evolutionary strategies, where mutation rate is itself subject to the evolutionary process. Okay. Now, let's look at different approaches to evolutionary robotics. So in evolutionary robotics, typically what people do is they start with a given robot and then they evolve the control typically a neural network, just as we did in the example that we looked at five minutes ago. Now, that's very nice from an engineering point of view. However, if you look at biological evolution, there you never have a robot or a creature, and afterwards you grow the brain for the creature, but you always have a co-evolution of morphology and control, right? And I think one of the first to evolve morphology and control simultaneously were uh, Carl Sims' uh, creatures. You know, he uh, was able to grow creatures like that. And before we look into how he actually did it, this co-evolution of morphology and control, let's have a just a short excerpt from a video, a one-minute excerpt from a video. Natan, can we have the video? And some very simple strategies came up which could still propel the creatures across the ground. Some with counterweights that just swung and others with two leg-like appendages that can flip over each other. Here's one that has kind of like a rowing strategy and he can go quite quickly along the ground. This is a relative of that creature that has a slight variation in his gait. Every stroke he does a somersault and then continues along. There was no selection against dizziness for these creatures. So that was a perfectly good solution. Okay, yeah, thank you. So what was the fitness function in this case? Maybe the local audience here in uh, Madrid, what was the fitness function that he used, obviously? Yeah, velocity, distance traveled, exactly. Uh, and then the nice thing about this is that's the only thing you need to tell to the system, to the evolutionary system, the fitness function, and then it will figure out everything by itself. Okay, now how did he do it? So we needed some kind of encoding in the genome. And so the, the encoding that he chose was a kind of a graph structure. This is now no longer only a bit string because with bit strings, it would have been you know, very difficult to get something useful out of the system. So he used a graph structure as an encoding and you can see here if you have a developmental process, this graph structures will grow into this physical structure here. This graph structure will grow into this physical structure. So we have this process of development. Now maybe we can briefly switch to Karlsruhe and you can comment on the nature of the, how can he characterize this developmental process? How would you characterize that? Anyone venture a, yeah, go ahead. Can't hear you. Can you switch on the microphone? Can you talk now? I think we hear some noise at least. Okay. Well, we'll have to do it. Uh, we'll have to do. We have to do it some other time. Okay. So I think the the point here is that the developmental process is entirely deterministic. That is, given a particular encoding in the genome there is going to be a particular phenotype. 
Now, if you look at biological systems, in biological systems you have a developmental process and the resulting phenotype depends on the specific interaction with the environment. So if you are born in Madrid, you most likely will be speaking Spanish when you are an adult. If you are born in China, you will be speaking Chinese. So the environment has a very strong influence on the particular uh, phenotype. So in this case, it's entirely de deterministic. The environment does not play a role in the developmental process. Now, a few years later, the, the, there was this famous uh, Golem project by Lipson and Pollock, and what they did, they did a very similar thing as uh, Carl Sims. They had bars, you know, certain length, diameter, and so on. And then at the end of the process, so they did the simulation, they evolved creatures also for speed, and at the end of the process, they had a 3D printer that would automatically produce these structures, except for the motors that had to be put in manually. But let's say in the, in the newspapers in the, in the US, you know, they said, like in, on the front page, for the first time in the history of mankind, there has been a self-reproducing robot. Now, uh, maybe we can have, uh, is NYU in Abu Dhabi connected? Maybe we can have a brief statement about, uh, about uh, the uh, Golem project and, you know, to what extent do you think these claims are justified? Yes, you want to... Uh, we can't hear you. <laughs> yes, hello? Yes, hello. It's okay now. Hi. Yeah, we actually don't have any background on, on that topic. Oh, okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's no problem. I think, I think the, uh, the whole evolution was conducted in the simulation, so it was very similar to what, what Carl Sims was doing, and the real-world realization was only at the very end of the evolutionary process, and so there was no feedback from the real world to the evolutionary process itself. So the fact that they produce the real world thing was only at the very end of the evolutionary process, which is still interesting, but it would have been more interesting to have the feedback from the real world into the evolutionary process itself. <clears throat> now, one of the issues with this uh, approach here is that you have to specify what sorts of components you have in the system. And that will constrain forever what you will be able to do with your robot, okay? So you will not be able to grow really, really complex structures like a muscle or a, a, a human brain or, you know, a very complex uh, skeleton. But you will be confined to these particular types of creatures. Now, if you look at biological systems, then again, the developmental process works differently. You don't have parameters. I mean, originally people thought there were parameters, you know, a gene coding for a particular property of the phenotype, like one gene for color of hair, one gene for body size, you know, one, she one gene for length of the nose, and so on. That was the original thinking. Now, with the Human Genome Project, it became entirely clear that development is not just mapping genes onto characteristics of the phenotype, but it's a complex dynamic of genetic regulatory networks that interact during the developmental process. And Josh Bongard, a couple of years ago, made models of, very simple models of genetic regulatory networks, and he was trying to apply to grow behaving creatures, so he had a developmental process which was guided by a genetic regulatory network, and he called his system artificial ontogeny, and one of the systems or creatures that he evolved was called the block pusher, so there was a heavy block in a simulated environment, and the creature had to push the large block. So maybe we can have the... Uh, 
video here not on Artificial ontogeny is a system for automatically evolving virtual robots or agents in a three-dimensional physics-based simulation for various user-defined tasks. In our first set of experiments, we evolved agents to push a large block in their environment as far as possible during a fixed time period. Here we see an agent growing from a single starting sphere into a set of connected spheres. These spheres are loosely modeled on biological cells, but also serve as the basic mechanical unit from which the agent is constructed. Each unit contains a complete copy of the genetic information shaping the growth of the agent, as well as sensors, motors, and neural structure. As these units grow and divide, so too does the neural structure grow inside the developing body. The agent shown here was extracted from one evolutionary run after two hours. At this point, artificial ontogeny has discovered how to grow the brain and body of the agent together to achieve an inchworm method of locomotion. This agent is a descendant of the previous one and appeared in the evolving population after a further two hours had elapsed. Here evolution has discovered that increased mass allows the agent to exert more force against the block. Also, the inchworm method of locomotion has been modified to create a long appendage that pushes against the block. White units contain both sensors and motors. Light gray units contain only sensors. The dark gray units contain only motors, and the black units are empty and only provide structural support. The combination of different types of units within a single agent indicates that cell differentiation has occurred. A genetic algorithm, based on genetic regulatory networks, was designed to first grow and then evaluate each agent from among a population of potential solutions. This agent was taken from a separate evolutionary run. In this run, artificial ontogeny discovers that pushing against the block with two points of contact, instead of one, is a much better strategy. The appendages support one another by lying across each other. These three agents, taken together, demonstrate that genetic regulatory networks can be used to design all aspects of an autonomous agent, including the body shape and size, the material from which the agent is constructed, the numbers and distribution of sensors and motors, and the construction of neural structure, which is distributed across the agent's body. The genetic regulatory networks are necessary because they allow evolution to grow, but also to modify different parts of the agent's body at the same time. Thus, changes to one component do not disrupt the other components. Okay. Okay, thank you, Nathan. So I think we have a very impressive example of the power of evolutionary algorithms based on genetic regulatory networks. And I think it's a more general approach to ontogenetic development than simply mapping a graph structure onto a phenotype because you really get the dynamics of the genetic regulatory networks, even if, they're, if the models are very simple. Okay, now one of the points that Josh uh, mentioned in, uh, in the video is this inchworm method of locomotion, which interestingly only works on the basis of local interactions between neighboring units in the uh, neural network. And it, by ex exploiting these local interactions, you get a global pattern of forward locomotion, which is another issue that we will be looking at also uh, next week, getting global patterns from uh, local interactions. And so the, the system here would be the genotype would be parameters of the genetic regulatory network rather than parameters of the phenotype, you know, like the length of the segments, the width of the segments, the types of the joints. It's the parameters of the genetic regulatory networks, and then you have transcription factors and so on, and you have all the details in the slides. I don't want to go into that. Please study the details. You should have enough information there that you can actually develop a certain understanding of how you can actually implement something like that. And I think it's an extremely powerful method. 
Now, I think what's, what's really uh, interesting is that the time scales are, of course, even though we can look at them separately, we have to understand them separately, they are tightly intertwined. So if, for example, at the phylogenetic level, something like a learning mechanism, a Hebbian learning mechanism that uh, you looked at in the other video has evolved, this will, of course, influence the ontogenetic development. But also, if you evolve certain characteristics of the system, for example, having a particular eye, insect eye, with a particular distribution of the facets, which is extremely powerful, this will influence the performance, which then will influence the fitness of the individuals, which will influence the selection, which in turn will influence the evolutionary process. So you always have to understand the interaction of these three timescales if you want to understand the evolution of intelligent behavior. Okay, now we have a couple of principles uh, that I don't want to go into uh, too much. One principle that's very important is we're always talking about populations. Evolution without populations makes no sense. We always need population, so we need population thinking. I, especially in Western societies, we have a tendency to think about individuals. The individual is the important thing. Here, it's population. The individual doesn't count that much. We have cumulative selection and self-organization. So cumulative selection, you can look that up later, but means that you try to keep the good stuff that you have from the evolutionary process and don't throw it away. We have brain-body coevolution. In biological evolution, you never have the body and then you evolve the brain for it, but the two evolve together. Scalable complexity, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point. Maybe you can read that in the book. Uh, evolution is a fluid process, so basically you have certain changes and if you have small changes, you shouldn't have changes that are too large in the phenotype, but sometimes you get large changes, but it's kind of a smooth process. And what we want to do, and that's an important principle, we want to minimize designer bias. So remember the square, and we tend to think inside the square and find a solution inside. That's our bias. We all have our biases because we grew up on this planet. You know, we have gravity, the environment is structured in particular ways, we have a particular society, so we have our biases without being aware of them. And evolutionary algorithms don't have these biases. That's why they can be extremely powerful and extremely useful. Okay, so assignments for next week, please read chapter six. That's about evolution, so cognition from scratch. There are some additional slides for self-study. And I need a volunteer for the uh, brain in the vet problem that you also find in the slides. We can do that after the lecture. And then uh, we have uh, two guest lectures. I will announce them now, and then we can switch to the speakers, so let me just briefly introduce the first guest speaker, uh, Professor Francesco Mondada from uh, EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland. He will talk about Towards Robots for Daily Life. I think if there is one person on the planet who has done uh, more than anyone else for educational robotics, for robotics in everyday life, it's uh, Francesco Mondada, uh, he is also very involved in this Swiss National Competence Center for Research in Robotics, where he is a, a project leader for robots in daily life, robots in school, robots in homes. So we're very much looking forward to him. So that's the first guest speaker and the second guest speaker that we have. Also a great pleasure, we have uh, Professor Robert Triner from ETH in Zurich who is also very involved and responsible for technology transfer in uh, the NCCR National Competence Center Robotics. He is an expert on rehabilitation 
Robotics is a world-renowned expert on rehabilitation robotics, and he will talk about design principles for intelligent rehabilitation. He will be, he's now, I'm not going to say on vacation in California, but he is on sabbatical. We call this sabbatical, which means that they are supposed to do research, but of course we all know that they also have very nice beaches in, uh, in uh, California, and as he, as Robert told me, um, he is enjoying the beaches as much as he is enjoying the research that he can do there. He will be uh, talking from uh, California, so in California he will be talking at 1.30 a.m., so thank you very much, Robert, for stay, staying up uh, uh, so late. We really appreciate that. Okay, now I suggest... <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, Robert. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. So I, th I suggest that now we take a five-minute break and we set up the uh, first uh, guest lecture by Francesco Mondada from Lausanne in Switzerland. Okay, so thanks very much. Let's take a five-minute break. Okay. So I, I think uh, this closes our program from today. So goodbye, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending, and thank you, f of course, to the to the speaker. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.